Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Niel Juris, Senior Director of Communications and Engagement for the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, also known as MORPSI. And I'm also a member of the CMC Board of Trustees. Today's forum is sponsored by the Robert Weiler Company, Installed Building Products and Marketer Incorporated. Yes, we can clap if you would like that. <laughs> Today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. Let's thank all of those supporting today's forum. Okay. Downtown Columbus is our region's largest employment center with 90,000 jobs, a number steadily growing prior to the pandemic. Now work from home trends threaten to undermine downtown's vibrancy. And despite many projects under construction and in the pipeline, downtown's residential population is not at the level needed to replace the foot traffic and spending from lost downtown workers. Today, our expert panel will map out the future trajectory of downtown Columbus. Please welcome today's speakers. Mark Conti, Executive Director of the Capital Crossroads and Discovery Special Improvement Districts, we call it SID. Michael Coleman, former mayor of the City of Columbus and partner with Public Affairs and Government Law Group of Ice Miller. Jeff Edwards, President and CEO of the Edwards Companies and our host, Mark Farincheck, Columbus Neighborhoods and Urban Issues Reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. You can learn more about today's speakers in your forum flyer. Before we hear from Mark Farincheck, Mark Conti will bring us up to speed on the state of downtown Columbus. Mark, the podium is yours. So thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you to Columbus Metropolitan Club for uh, having me back again this year. It's an honor. Uh, as Neil mentioned, I work for the Capital Crossroads and Discovery Special Improvement Districts. These two organizations were created by property owners in downtown to provide services in the public realm, including cleaning, supplemental safety, homeless outreach, beautification promotions, the Pearl Market. This year, we'll also be doing the uh, Moonlight and Sunlight Markets and downtown CPAS. We also prepare this annual report on the, the health of downtown. But before I start, I, I, I do see my predecessor in the audience. So everyone should know Cleve Ricksecker, who began, who founded and ran these organizations uh, for 20 years. He retired at the, at, the, uh, May, at the end of May of 2020, and because of the pandemic, we were not able to give him a proper send off. So while he's here and while there's a big room, please give him a big round of applause. So thank you, Cleve. But yeah, as I mentioned, we also prepare this annual report on downtown. You can find the full report online at downtownservices.org or on your uh, table. There's a, a business card on the back as a QR code. You can use that with your, your smartphone and get to the report. But not yet. Listen to uh, our, our expert panel first. So as we approach the second anniversary of the governor's first stay-at-home order, we're still grappling with just how the pandemic has impacted downtown. Uh, and 2021 didn't really provide us with a whole lot of answers. Downtown residential still continues to be a very big bright spot. The U.S. Census Bureau released their official tabulation for 2020 and showed that downtown surpassed 10,000 residents that year, a population level not seen since the early 1970s, and higher than what I initially estimated for that year. By the end of 2021, downtown's population grew to 11,200. Though 880 new units came to the market last year, the apartment occupancy rate increased, rising from 86% in 2020 to 92%. And with 14 projects underway, housing projects, and another 19 housing projects proposed, downtown could see close to 15,000 residents by the end of 2024. Data was mixed in the hospitality sector. Traffic began to rebound at a lot of the downtown attractions but most of the significant festivals and the big conventions didn't return. Downtown had nearly 3 million visitors in 2021, more than double that of 2020. However, it's a far cry from the 10 million visitors we normally have like we did in 2019. Hotels only reached an occupancy rate of 35%, while they had a 66% occupancy in 2019. Thankfully, there was a lot in store for 2022. 
Major festivals are returning, including the Arts Festival, the Jazz and Rib Fest, and Columbus Pride March. The Convention Center already has 163 events planned for this year so far, and this is almost as many as they had for the entirety of last year, and the Convention Center continues to book more events. The jury, though, is still out when it comes to the office market and downtown employment. Most companies planned to bring workers back last year, but were stymied by the two different COVID variants. Even so, CBRE reported a slight decrease in the office vacancy rate and positive net absorption, so it would seem that companies still want office space and still want to be downtown. Spencer Levy, an uh, economic analyst for CBRE, predicts a 9% reduction in office demand nationally. This means some companies will shrink more than that, some will shrink less, and some will actually expand. The tech industry in particular seems to be bullish on more office space. The New York Times this week cited a CBRE study which found that the tech industry leased 76% more office space than it did a year earlier. But in this new age of worker flexibility, and, and it's the, the, the theme we've been hearing the last two years is that workers want to maintain some flexibility with the workplace, companies have two big questions they're going to have to answer. How much space do they need and how will that space get used? A big reason for bringing employees back to the office and having them physically together is to encourage collaboration and spark creativity. So office space will need to accommodate that kind of work. At the same time, an employee won't be in a, in a day-long brainstorming session, or at least I hope not. I wouldn't want to be. So the office space will also need to be, accommodate those workers who need time to work alone and focus. And then the companies are going to have to figure out how the whole hybrid situation is going to work. You need the room if all the workers are come, gonna come in on the same day, and if any indication uh, I could get from today when I went into a, a Starbucks this morning is everybody was coming in to work on Wednesday. So given all of this, reconfiguring the office is probably gonna be at the top of mind for most companies more than uh, how much space they're, they're actually gonna need. Over on uh, transportation, we have really uh, two exciting proposals over there. First, there was a tremendous amount of planning and public input on the Link Us project. This is the high capacity bus rapid transit corridor study. Two lines converging on downtown, one going northwest, another going east-west, crossing the county. These lines will help spark more development both downtown and along the corridors. And I expect that these, the new development with these new lines will be a lot more pedestrian friendly, and I hope we'll see less of a need for uh, uh, developers to accommodate parking in, in new projects once these lines are, are going. These proposals will keep advancing this year and so they can be positioned for a federal funding request. Second is the proposal for the return of Amtrak service to Columbus. With the passage last year of the federal infrastructure bill, the line connecting Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, and Cincinnati, or the 3 C and D line, that becomes a real possibility. Amtrak has identified Columbus as a market they want to be in. And recently, the Franklin County Convention, Visitor, or Convention Facilities Authority released their feasibility study for adding a train station to their building. This is going to provide a great way for visitors and business travelers to get to Columbus and have them dropped off right at downtown's doorstep. Local leaders are also pushing for a Chicago-Columbus-Pittsburgh line to be included in Amtrak's new corridor development program. So downtown continues to grow and change, and you have an opportunity right now to give input on downtown's future. The Columbus Downtown Development Corporation is continuing to seek input on a strategic plan to envision the next wave of change in downtown. You're here today or watching at home online because you have some interest in seeing downtown succeed, and I know everyone has an opinion about downtown. So after the forum, again, after we're done talking, go to downtowncolumbus.com. You can take a survey, you can add a comment to the idea wall, or uh, uh, put an idea on the interactive map, or you can further discussion that's already happening on, on a lot of these uh, ideas that are already posted. So for the report, to look at the report, go to downtownservices.org. To then comment on the, down, the uh, downtown strategic plan, go to downtowncolumbus.com. And now I'll turn the podium over to Mark Ferencheck to lead today's conversation. Thanks. And uh, thanks everybody for being here too. Um, just a very basic question to start out with. Obviously, we're going to get into downtown offices and workers coming back, but for people who 
don't work downtown or live downtown or don't visit downtown often, why is it important to have a strong downtown at this point? All right, everybody's looking at me. <laughs> Uh, so let me try to respond to that, and it's great to see everybody here, Mark, um, you know, uh, who cares about the facts today? I never cared about them before, so I might as well tell what's on my mind. <laughs> uh, uh, why is downtown important? Well, it's the center of our culture, our entertainment, our uh, livelihood, and let me talk a little bit about livelihood. It's a one square mile uh, area. More revenue is generated in that one square mile area for city income tax to pay for neighborhoods, police officers, firefighters, uh, fire trucks, uh, rec centers, than any other place in the city. And if it's not vibrant, then our neighborhoods are vibrant. And all those things that our neighborhoods depend on will not get funded, period. So downtown's important economically to our uh, entire city as well as our central Ohio area. Uh, I view it as our living room and our, our, our place where we come together as people to enjoy, to work, to play. Uh, that was not always the case though, Mark, as you well know. At one time, uh, you could come downtown on Saturday and you could hear, hear the echoes of your voice. At 5.30 on any given day or 6 o'clock, you could roll a bowling ball down uh, Broad Street and not hit anybody <laughs> because no one was here. Uh, and what we've tried to do over the past 20 plus years, and a lot of folks involved in this uh, that help CDDC and the city of Columbus, developers, is to make downtown the place to come, to be, to enjoy, to experience building amenities uh, uh, and a, a place to live, work, and, 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 and play and, and entertain. It is the focal point of our region. It needs to be successful. And in addition, everyone has a piece of the rock of downtown. Everyone has a vested interest in the success of our downtown. And uh, uh, we are a group of almost one million shareholders in the city of Columbus. And uh, everyone owns a, a, a share, at least a share, in the benefit of our downtown. So that's it in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't add anything to that uh, other than to say, you know, we've, I think we've all been places where uh, there is no there there. And so we, we have a there here uh, and, and we have a heart. And uh, there are, you know, so many things that we have in town, you can only have one of. And so a lot of those attractions, in fact, and our, our arts and culture heart, they're all downtown, and so we got to make sure we're, we have a strong downtown and we're still supporting all of that. And many of those uh, institutions and facilities are pretty world class to start with. And I realize this is somewhat you know, anecdotal, but it's really hard to find a city that's prospering that doesn't have a healthy downtown. Yeah. So, so living is important downtown, Mark. Yeah. You know, uh, you mentioned, you know, 10,000 plus residents and that was a stake in the ground I put put and said you know ten, why 10,000 hell I don't know <laughs> but it sure <laughs> but it, it but it was just our north star you had to have a goal and you know uh, I didn't realize we just crossed 10,000 I've been saying for 10 years we had 10,000 <laughs> anyway enough of the jokes go ahead <laughs> I do want to get back to the residential question because that's a big part of downtown's future, but obviously one of the big concerns right now is whether office workers are going to come back in significant numbers to support businesses and downtown's health. And just wondering what your opinions are on that, how important office work still is for downtown, and what do companies and building owners need to do to help attract people back downtown to work specifically? Well, as I mentioned, I, th I think we'll see uh, 
less people working downtown. I think that's a given. We know there's gonna be some portion of the, the downtown workforce, they're gonna work from home permanently. There'll be some portion working from, working in the office every day. Then we have all these people in the middle that'll come in some days a week or maybe it's every other week. That's the number we don't yet have a good handle on. We, we were doing surveys last year uh, uh, asking companies what their plans were and every time we get the results back then something else would happen. We'd get another variant and everybody's plans would just, would just go up in the air. And so I think the, the uh, important thing, on, on the one hand companies are just trying to figure out from the pandemic side when's the appropriate time to bring everyone back. But then when they, when they are bringing, ba bringing people back, it's gonna be important for companies to, to know why do, the, why do you want these people physically in the office? And, and it goes back to what I said about uh, uh, sparking creativity, encouraging collaboration. And so if, if the office work environment isn't set up for that, it's gonna need to be because that's the reason you're gonna wanna have these people uh, physically together. And then in downtown in particular, we have a, a great opportunity because we have such a concentration of workers that uh, in addition to interacting with people within your office, you're interacting with people at other companies, maybe it's in your industry, maybe it's outside of your industry, but those uh, spontaneous collisions, the serendipity that's happening in coffee houses and, and out on the street when you go to lunch, you're not gonna get that in your home office on Zoom. So, uh, go, uh, go ahead, I have a, an opinion. My comment about, about uh, not necessarily being fact-based, but in, you know, in my opinion, and I guess in interactions with uh, people on a day-to-day -day basis out in the business world and, and even socially, I think, quite frankly, that the idea that you would work from home all the time is, is grossly overstated. And I haven't even met yet anybody that would say that that's exactly what they want to do. Now, flexibility in their work life and in the hours, absolutely. That's been present, though, even pre-COVID. Uh, but, uh, you know, prior, prior to COVID, downtown was on an absolute roll, in my opinion, and I think even though there was a step change actually during Mayor Coleman's administration, you could kind of just you know, wake up one day and, and you didn't realize it, but all of a sudden downtown was much different. I think we were on the verge of another round of that. You know, maybe one of the most important things that's gonna come on a go forward basis as we continue to build out parking lots and we get more connectivity in what is otherwise a very large downtown. But our employment base, although spectacular prior to COVID in terms of almost being recession proof with the government workers, et cetera, financial institutions, insurance, businesses was probably about as poorly uh, put together to handle a pandemic as almost any employment base you could have because all your government workers were basically sent home, all your financial institutions, all your insurance companies, all your higher education uh, institutions. And so I don't know exactly what percentage of the downtown workforce that is in total, you might, uh, but it was a significant, significant portion and it's really vitally important. I, we've even talked about it at the CDDC, uh, CDDC level as being more or less a civic duty, I think, for employers to call their workers back to work. So I have a very strong opinion about this. Uh, Mark, I disagree with you and I agree with Jeff. Uh, what you're describing, Mark, with all due respect, is the way things are today. The pandemic has caused people to stay home and to work at home. That is not the future. Because what I have learned in talking to business leaders is that uh, employees are more productive when they're not at home, when they have another human being to interact with, uh, when uh, they're able to be creative and uh, engage with other human beings rather than be in the isolation of the home, the pandemic has given options for people to live at home, I mean, to work at home. Uh, but the economy and that business and that person is more efficient when we're together. And that's what business leaders are figuring out today. My company is gonna be better when I have employees working together in space that works for them. Now that, I agree with you on this part, that as time goes on, I think actually our downtown office market will flourish, not decline, because uh, you even mentioned it. Around the country, tech technology firms are investing heavily in office space because they know their employees work better when they are together as opposed to apart. And so the challenge we have downtown, frankly, we are at a point of great alignment 
with business. Uh, and I think things will be different going forward than when they were in the past. I think there will be more people working at home than in, in their office. But I think downtown will flourish because uh, uh, I believe that the businesses will want to create space with the amenities and make it functional and great for the employee. Because what's happening now is that um, businesses are having a hard time recruiting anybody in this, in this market. Recruiting the, the uh, folks for jobs in the, in the business environment is tough. So how do you become competitive? The way you co become competitive is to create an office space that's better than the next city, that's better than the next community. Because young people these days, when they consider new jobs, they don't consider anything, uh, they don't consider how their house is going to look. They're going to they're gonna consider what the amenities are in the community they're going to move into. They look at the community first. That's what they look at. And so I think that office development is going to grow downtown in time just differently. And that's why we're, having, we're going through this uh, plan with CDDC, our strategic plan that we've asked everybody to engage in because I think there's a general belief that we just have to change what we're doing to accommodate the future, not do what we've done in the past. And, uh, and I just think we're going to do very well in office space development. And I think we ought to be recruiting technology companies in the downtown because they're the ones that want to expand office space. Well, that, that's, a, that's a good point, especially with the Intel news. So that's obviously going to have a huge impact on this region. Uh, but how do you think that will affect downtown in terms of employment, in terms of housing, and in terms of drawing other companies to this area as well? And again, how will the downtown benefit by that? I think it's, uh, to me, it is 100 percent clear that Intel will be the best thing that ever happens to this region in generations and downtown will benefit because of it. Uh, we have now become a place where technology wants to be relocated. I heard the other day and, uh, and who cares about facts, right? I heard the other day that 43 other companies Technology companies are relocating to Central Ohio just because Intel has decided to in, uh, uh, provide that uh, actually a hundred billion dollar investment over a number of years. They're going to want people going to want places to live. They're going to be headquarters. There'll be sub headquarters. There'll be regional headquarters. They're going to want cool spaces with amenities and downtown Columbus will be at the top of the list, along with other areas. But we all benefit, we're all lifted up as a result of Intel coming into this community. I mean, the, the number that's been touted, I think, is 100,000 people when you include spinoff jobs and everything else. And I think, quite frankly, that uh, we won't have done our job, whether it's CDDC or developers downtown or just as, as citizens, if we don't end up with more than our fair share of those 100,000 uh, people moving into the area, you know, you know, actually living downtown. I mean, if we don't end up with 10 or 15,000 of the 100,000, uh, I don't think we did the job that we should have done. And, and if you think about the investment Honda's made in Marysville and how much we've seen a benefit in Franklin County and even a little bit in downtown because of that, well, this is 20 miles closer. And so the drive time between downtown and the Intel site is, is within our range of, of commuting times, at least given our, our current traffic and our current, current street grid. Uh, we'll see what we can do with a, a transit investment as well. But so from a living perspective, we most certainly can capture a lot of the people who will end up working at the Intel site. And then as, as uh, uh, the others have mentioned, just being able to then capture the new businesses that are gonna spring up here or the, the companies that will relocate here that may not, to, they might wanna be in central Ohio, but they may not need to be right next door to, to Intel and downtown offers them a great opportunity. I want to talk to Mr. Edwards a little bit. You've, uh, your company's invested a lot of money in downtown development, obviously, with projects that are already completed. You've got a few underway in terms of residential. 
you're building your own house downtown, so you're gonna be personally invested in downtown. Why are you so uh, assured that the demand for housing downtown will continue since you're investing a lot of money in that? Well, as this mayor mentioned earlier, I mean, downtown is uh, is a place where there are a number of things, whether it's arts and culture, you know, specifically, sporting events, arenas, uh, stadiums, et cetera. You really can't find that anywhere else in the city. And, you know, it's, it's, it's downtown's job, I guess, all of our job, to make sure that uh, those things are, you know, patronized and, and continue to be unique versus uh, kind of suburban, what I would call kind of... Uh, somewhat not to be you know offensive to any other developers that may or may not be here but <laughs> somewhat kind of uh, fake urban areas out in the suburbs let's say in fact I think I saw in a, something that it preliminarily that was punched out here in writing that was referred to as suburban downtowns and I didn't know there was such a thing to be honest with you <laughs> I thought there was one but uh, in any event, so I, I, I think other than a, you know, kind of a stutter step, and it was a heck of a stutter step as it relates to the pandemic two years later, but that we get, again, we were on such a roll that I, I think it will come back, you know, and I think we're lucky to be in central Ohio, obviously, versus other parts of the state. When you see facts and figures like that central Ohio uh, area grew from 2010 to 2020, 100,000 people, and yet the state of Ohio shrank 189,000 people. It's two different worlds here in Ohio, and so we're very fortunate in that regard. I mentioned to, to some of the panelists here earlier, a friend of mine growing up is actually the CEO. He grew up here in Columbus, and uh, he was in town for the groundbreaking at Amgen because he's the CEO of Amgen. And so I get little snippets from him by text every once in a while, and, and literally uh, he said, my friend's at Google, and when he says his friend's at Google is not you know, a lower level employee, he said, he said, my friends at Google have said that they're moving more people to central Ohio than from California than anywhere else in the country, which is this, it's just mind boggling. As Mayor mentioned that we're somehow going to be, I don't think it's a, a bunch of, you know, baloney about the idea that would be, you know, the Midwest Silicon Valley. So it's, it's I think, unbelievably important. I think the ripple effects, uh, I'm sure there'll be some growing pains and some things that are probably uncomfortable and we'll probably all, you know, be upset every once in a while and worse traffic than we have now. But in general, I think it's going to be a very good thing. For downtown. Do you think that downtown housing is dependent on the number of office workers downtown, or is it beyond that at this point because of the lack of housing in general that's being developed here in central Ohio? Without question. That, that's true also, I think. You know, and the other thing is that because the infrastructure is in place here, it's pretty, it would be pretty green, too, of us as a city to go ahead and get 30,000 residents downtown with water lines, traffic, you know, uh, roadways, sewer, power grid, et cetera, that already exists, rather than continue to just go east and north. And not everyone's going to want to, you know, actually live in that area. And, when we, you know, I think all of us have a question, although it's been somewhat answered in, in written press lately in articles and things, is where are these workers going to come from, right? Because they don't exist currently uh, in our, you know, area. And everything I've been able to gather and been told is that there's, you know, they're going to pull from probably a six or eight or ten state area out of the universities, a younger person who's been, you know, has an education or some uh, other skill set that's been groomed to kind of get into this industry. And those people are the ones that if you, you read it, even, the, you know, the urban, the urban, you know, kind of movement uh, in terms of young people, again, it took a, it took a stutter step and it was kind of, truncated during the pandemic, but I think it's, it's been demonstrated that it, you know, kind of that flight and that movement back to that, uh, downtowns and the things that work in, as it relates to downtowns is back on again. Uh, Mark brought up public transportation, and uh, so there's a, the chance that Amtrak could return to Columbus. Um, they're also building, again, a new uh, Coda bus terminals plan for where the Greyhound station is right now. How could those two things uh, contribute to downtown development, having those two types of centers downtown? Well, yeah, as I mentioned, I mean, the, to have the, the folks coming from other cities, coming from Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Dayton, being let off right at our doorstep up at Nationwide and High, uh, certainly that's going to be help the hotel rooms uh, for downtown. That'll help a lot of our downtown attractions to be able to you know, other cities in the, in the state being able to travel to Columbus to go to shows, go to the only NHL team in the state, you know, things that are really unique to, to us. 
uh, but it's also going to make it more attractive to live here that, that now if you could uh, not only uh, travel around the city without a car, but actually travel to other close by cities without a car, uh, that just is going to make Columbus that much more attractive. I mean, we're, we're the, what, the second largest city in the country without Amtrak service, uh, and it, 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 it shows, it's noticeable. Um, there were some high-profile uh, incidents downtown last year involving crime, including uh, the death of a, a young woman at Bicentennial Park back in May, some other uh, incidents involving some nightclubs after hours. I did a story back in December, though, that showed that crime reports were actually down over the past several years. Having said that, do you think that the perception of crime downtown is hurting downtown's ability to rebound uh, after COVID? I, well, the perception question's hard because the, 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 there's, you know, I, I only have anecdotes. I have the people I, I talk to personally and then I see these comments on message boards and I wonder with a lot of those folks if they've been downtown even in the last 10 years or in the last five years. But, uh, you know, looking at the landscape today, you know, right now during the pandemic, if you come downtown, because we have much less foot traffic uh, from the office workers, the, the people who are in need or in crisis out on the street, they are much more noticeable. But because of our, our two organizations uh, and the partnership we have with CDDC and all the property owners, we're holistically addressing that and we've been doing that for 20 years. So a lot of what you've been hearing lately about rethinking policing and rethinking public safety is something the, the special improvement districts have known for a long time. We have uniformed ambassadors out on the streets seven days a week. Uh, we have two homeless outreach workers along with a half-time peer outreach worker. So anybody who looks like they're in need or in crisis uh, in downtown, we're working with them to get connect them with services, shelter, permanent housing, meals, whatever, whatever it is they might be in need of. We also have uh, special duty officers that are on, on duty seven days a week to provide a reassuring presence and respond to issues as they come up. That's in addition to the regular 16th precinct officers. And then we have a, a, a vast communication network with all the private security operations, the division of police, the city attorney's office, the social service agencies. We're all working very hand in hand to address any of these issues that are coming up. And, and so, as you mentioned, you know, violent crime has decreased. We, we've had these high profile incidents, uh, but it really, while, while they're terrible, I, I still want to emphasize that they're the exception rather than the norm uh, that's happening every day. Wonderful answer, and it's the right thing to do. First of all, um, in regards to the perception of whether downtown's safe or not, and whether that's influencing, uh, you know, movement of people, you know, moving into downtown, it, I would probably say that almost absolutely it, it, it has some effect. Now, what I would say is, is that's mostly you hear that, or at least I do, out of people's mouths who never really intended to relocate downtown. They're a suburban person, you know, and. Over the years, I lived downtown in the 80s, um, then had our first child and moved out, you know, to where we had a yard and all that, and we're on our way back downtown. But uh, my observation over the last 30 years or so of building units either in downtown or near downtown is that people who live downtown is, is kind of a, a, a tough bunch, and I mean that in a good way, right? They, they want to be urban because they want to be urban. These kind of things come part and parcel with living downtown. It maybe even adds to the fabric to a degree. Now, no, you don't want to be involved in a violent crime, and, but in general, it's probably very much overblown. And I think for the target kind of audience to live downtown, I think they see through it for the most part. So I think two things. One is that downtown needs to be, in fact, safe. And then number two is downtown needs to be perceived safe. Those are two different things. Uh, when the high profile uh, incidents occurred, Greg Davies and Amy Taylor, you Mark and others came together uh, to address the in fact safe issue. And I will say that downtown is in fact safe as a result of all, the, all that work and all the work you've done, uh, Mark. So yes, it is safe. Uh, the question of perception is the thing that needs to be tackled. Uh, 
because I can remember when we were just starting out on this effort to develop downtown and trying to get people interested, even organizations interested. And they, I won't mention them, but I remember them, I put it in my book. <laughs> uh, they did not want to come downtown because of the crime. So I did a little study in house. And the crime in downtown was less than the crime where the organization was located. I said, now, do you want to move away from there where you are now and move down here? Using your argument, you should be downtown. Uh, so perception and reality are two different things we have to address. We continue to, the, to address the reality, but also address the perception. And uh, that takes an entire community to say, look, that's just not true. And the more people that come downtown, which is happening as we speak, the more word gets out that, hey, it's fine. Um, and the more offices that are downtown and will continue to develop downtown, uh, that'll be the case as well. The thing we need to focus on, among many things downtown, Mark, is retail. We need to see, uh, uh, on and, and transportation, issues like that, to connect up. Uh, and maybe retail is like in nodes around downtown where, where uh, uh, residents gather with apartments, or maybe there's a, a larger presence. Uh, but I think we're at the tipping point right now, as we speak, of more significant retail downtown. Transportation, connecting things up. Uh, uh, you know, Bob Weiler had a great idea, uh, and that was free transit uh, throughout the region. Uh, and kudos to you, Bob. Uh, uh, but I think all the things related to transportation and transit helps connect up the things we need to have connected up in, in order to make downtown work better. Um, we will move the questions from our live stream and in-person audiences in just a few minutes. So if you have a question, please make your way to the microphone now, if you could. Um, just have one more question for uh, the three of you, just based on your travels elsewhere. Are, is there, are there other, other cities doing anything to, in their downtowns that you think Columbus should look at or that you find interesting that our audience might be interested in that uh, could be applied here? Uh, why don't you start? You do the most traveling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, and I should probably say this in the right way, it, it's cumbersome uh, from a permitting perspective, and I don't just mean building permits, but other, you know, business permits, et cetera, restaurants, et cetera, like that, sometimes to get things done in Columbus. And I can think specifically about, you know, most all of the cities that I think we went, I went to during the pandemic when you were allowed to travel and how they, like from a restaurant perspective, handled outdoor dining and things like that. And really none of that went on here. Um, so I think somehow a, you know, kind of a lessening of some of the hoops that you've got to jump through in a, in a kind of reactivation of the street based on, um, you know, at least that aspect we could have probably handled a little better you know I can remember specifically having a cheeseburger in February outside of Manhattan and it was fine right and you couldn't you know that just didn't happen here right and as a result I think a lot of restaurants are not here any longer or struggled mightily and um, I think we would have all of us would have felt a little more normal I guess getting through the whole process had that been the case but so I think I don't think we handled that maybe as well as we could and I, I have a you know in terms of kind of maybe not forcing the office worker back into the office, but I think that there's been a, a stronger uh, push maybe elsewhere than there has been here thus far. I know there's efforts being made in that regard to get people back to work. Um, I think we need to push maybe even harder. So I think that, uh, you know, we're putting together, CDDC's putting together a strategic plan. Uh, but one of the things we've talked about at CDC board is the notion of we need to look at other downtowns. We need to uh, 
test it, go to other cities and say, well, what's happening in your downtown is not happening in our downtown, and how'd you do it? And learn from it. Uh, you, we've come a long way from where we were in the 90s and 80s to where we are today. Uh, but we're going to have a new downtown going forward, and, and what is it we need to do and focus on? And, and go to those other cities with business leadership, with government leaders, with civic leaders, and actually sit down what's going on in other communities and see what they're doing better than us. Uh, I think Columbus is the best city in the nation, but there's, we can always be better. And, and I think we can learn from any city in the country, large or small, both their successes and their failures, and, and even some cities outside the country. So, uh, you know, when it comes to retail, there are great examples of retail recruitment programs in other downtowns or retail incentives for property owners to build out spaces so they're, they're ready for small independent retailers that are looking to open up in, in downtown. And, and the pandemic has actually presented this great opportunity that we could see the swell of entrepreneurship come out of that of, again, the great resignation, people leaving whatever they were doing and wanting to strike out on their own and do something. And we should be set up to, to handle that. We're, we're making great strides, I think, on transportation, as I mentioned, with both Link Us, Bus Rapid Transit, and, and looking for Amtrak service. Uh, but then we can, again, thinking about what's next, and we could have a really great sustainability agenda. Uh, can we get more green roofs downtown, solar panels? Um, can uh, uh, buildings, it used to be the big thing for buildings to get LEED certified. We haven't heard too much about that lately, but there's now new green building standards uh, that we could be pushing for as, other th as buildings get built and redeveloped in, in downtown. Uh, and, and one of the biggest uh, uh, green issues of all, again, is back to transportation. And, and if we can get people to, to get to downtown without bringing this two-ton piece of metal, uh, that, that would be much, uh, much preferred. And if they can come by bus, bike, uh, walk, all those, all those methods would be great. One last point. I agree 100% with everything you said on that. Design. Uh, the way buildings look, the way downtown looks, the, the way it feels. Uh, you can go in some cities and see the diversity of design. Uh, and I don't think a, a great downtown looks the same on every block. Uh, I think every building has its own uniqueness about it. And, uh, and, and you go to New York or other cities, and the design matters on how a city feels, look, and whether there's further investment. Uh, and I'd love to see Columbus become more focused on architecture and the design. Of, but that's just one of things, one of 100 things. Yeah. <laughs> the number of residents downtown that we should be over the next 10 years with Intel and everything else that's going on, a lot of the things we've discussed fix themselves and become very viable. You know, a density of population 24-7 yeah. does a lot. I mean, it's been talked about, I remember even way back when with uh, Mayor Reinhardt talking about a 24-7, 365 downtown, which was a pipe dream then, right? It was just marketing, I guess, because there wasn't anybody downtown. Today, it's a reality. You put 10,000 more people downtown, it really becomes a reality. Yeah. So it's the uh, Metropolitan Club's uh, longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Um, Jane is uh, curating questions from today's live stream audience. Um, please keep your questions brief and to the point. Jane, what's the first question? I have several from the live stream audience, and we'll do every other one. So if you all have a question, come on up. Emily uh, Pet Preto, I think is how she says her name, contractors told me my neighborhood water and gas cannot support the growth. So how does Mr. Edwards propose sensible growth in downtown neighborhoods for infrastructure? Um, I'm not sure where she lives. Uh, but in general, Downtown is as well positioned as anywhere really in the in the in the whole Central Ohio region to be able to handle uh, more building, you know. And even you know, we didn't talk about this specifically, but you know, in terms of fire and police that exists. I mean, it's very much set up. You know, again, not knowing exactly where she lives. Uh, and that's not to say that I'm sure there's some parts of downtown that aren't quite serviced as well as others. But um, ultimately, I I know just from 
building downtown that in general you can get to power, you can get to water, you can get to sewer, you can have police and fire, et cetera, and roads are there. So um, it supported 30,000 residents 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So um, that's a specific, though, I guess, locational issue I can't really answer 100%. We need more density downtown, not less. We have more parking lots than buildings downtown. We've got to eliminate parking lots, put buildings on them, and people in them. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Rajadaksha. I'm a principal at Bayer Environmental. We're a small 10 person environmental firm. We thought about, explored, looking at downtown. We can find great rental rates, but what is preventing us is that the rates of parking have not come down. And if you have staff that are co-working or high, doing the hybrid schedule, having to pay $200 a month for parking is not really economically realistic. Is the city or parking agencies working anything to make parking more affordable, especially if people aren't working full-time in the office? Well, one possibility, of course, is uh, if you're in the Capitol Crossroads SID, you're, all your employees are eligible for downtown CPASS, and so they could have basically free bus service to and from work and be able to use that any other day of the week. Um, but even if you're not in the, in the CPASS boundary, uh, just buying uh, COTA monthly passes is gonna be cheaper than that parking. And, and then on top of that, your employees are gonna get all that time back when they're on the bus. Uh, and the buses have Wi-Fi, so you could, you could be working if you want to do that, or you could be just enjoying uh, another show on Netflix. I don't know of any specific thing that's uh, governmentally driven that, you know, to kind of subsidize parking per se, other than for a while the city was actually in the business of building parking garages. It didn't have anything to do with rate. It had to do with availability. Um, I can tell you as a parking garage owner that I'm certainly certain that we are not charging uh, what we charge for, you know, pre-2019 currently. So it's, it's available, I think, and there's more of it. And, and uh, you know, Mayor mentioned this earlier, and it has somewhat to do with, with parking and in, 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 in not really. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that I think there will be an improvement in the office stock over time. I mean, we ourselves have taken about 350,000 square feet of B slash, you know, slash C office space off the market. You know, the, the, the reason why vacancy rates down is for reasons like that, and to the extent that we can take office buildings that really aren't desirable to work in, turn those into residential buildings, tighten up the office square footage a bit, and build improved office, that's also going to be a big win. I, don't, I do not envision parking rates going down. I envision them going up. And this, I'm just being real. Uh, and that Columbus's, one of Columbus's challenges is that we want to pull up to the building, get out, and walk in. And you can't do that anywhere else in the country. And the cost of parking here is substantially less than parking around the nation. So I think part of the answer is going to be uh, your employees need to move downtown. <laughs> and and rely upon transit to get around. Well, while we're on transportation, Marla Jones, are there plans to make major transportation changes with getting people from the suburbs to New Albany, the Intel site, or new work sites? Today, it's still a challenge to get downtown. That's not a topic for a forum. <laughs> <laughs> done about 10 of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know the answers to all that, but uh, uh, the, the transportation gurus in the city, which include CODA and others, the city, I'm sure they're all working on that. Transit is a very critical component to our quality of life, our economics, and our, our, where we live. So uh, I'm sure they're on it. Hi, I'm Mindy Justice. Um, as a downtown resident, I want to say, yes, I completely agree on how safe it is, so I'm glad the, to hear you guys echo that. Um, my question, and Mark, you kind of took it a little bit away from me. What role do you think tree canopies, green space, and kind of with how it's designed, um, how, what role that plays in the future of a thriving downtown? From, from the SIDS perspective, we're actually very interested in seeing the, the tree canopy increase downtown. Uh, the city adopted a new urban forestry master plan uh, that we're hoping to pig piggyback off of. 
you know, one of, one of the best things we can do with all the sidewalks, you know, the, the big buzzword, of course, is placemaking, but, we'll, you know, the easiest thing to do is to just get some street trees up first, and if we can get some other things like public art and, and other installations, that'll be even better. Uh, and it'll, it'll make the walks ple more pleasant, it'll, it'll bring down the temperature in the summer, uh, and, and again, it just helps our overall sustainability of downtown and, and for the, the region. Yeah, I mean, the city of Columbus, uh, for all of the good things, does suffer from sidewalks that are too wide and really right-of-ways that are too wide. And so that feeling that you'd get, like, say, in downtown Charlotte, where it feels tighter and there's, a, you know, street trees, it feels more residential and, and kind of nicer in that regard, needs to be remedied in certain places. It's like when the city, it's a combination of the city and ourselves kind of surreptitiously came together on the Gay Street corridor and took what was a five way, I think it was five lanes at the time, three of three one way, you know, heading in the east and two parking lanes and cut that down to really two lanes, one east and one west. And the boulevard, you know, kind of concept went in and it completely changed the nature of the street and some more things like that. Um, like Broad Street. Yes. Broad, Broad Street is adequately named Broad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, Cars go down there 60 miles an hour, uh, trying to get to the other side, uh, wherever they're going. And you know, I I remember when we really focused on streets, especially in your area over there. It was total success, uh, and it's been a, a marvelous success. But I think how traffic patterns take place. I remember having debates, serious debates, that I won with uh, staff, uh, engineering staff, traffic engineering staff. They want every street to be one way, every street to be uh, a mile wide, uh, and we uh, debated it, particularly in uh, alongside a mile, Gay Street and other areas, uh, to slow down the traffic, get people to walk, and as much as I love Broad Street, and Broad and High is the center of the universe, um, it, it needs to be addressed because that span from Kosai all the way east, uh, it's, you know, we either got to widen the, widen the street or uh, widen the sidewalk or put mediums in or something. I'm not an expert here, but slow it down and get people walking again, walking and talking. Well, it becomes even more important with the... Absolutely. With the peninsula, the amount of investment going into the peninsula, you know, I grew up here in Columbus, and, I, 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 you know, it's almost like you woke up from a dream uh, in terms of kind of what's over there now and what's going on. And if the idea is, is that we're going to somehow connect it and we're going to, you know, make life around the riverfront, you know, that much more engaging and all that, we've got a pretty big, as you, as you pointed out, I mean, between the government buildings that head from High Street down to the water and, and the ex actual expanse of Broad Street, et cetera, there's a, there's a large gap there that needs to be, you know, kind of in a friendly way, pedestrian-friendly way bridged. So I have, I have questions from three people that are all uh, revolve around retail. Jill, uh, Dana Miller, Jim Hartman, and Carl Fowler are all asking questions about, and, and I'm going to summarize this, is there an effort perhaps the CDC or CDDC to recruit retail to downtown. Restaurants, a, a small target, um, possibly entrepreneur shops. Is there a plan? Well, I, I can't speak to what CDDC is doing other than I'm sure we'll see something come out of the strategic plan regarding retail. But uh, years ago, the, the Special Improvement District did do a retail recruitment project where we went out and talked with every independent retailer we could possibly talk to, built up a, a, a Rolodex, if you remember what that was, um, and even then it wasn't really a Rolodex, but built up a list of, of businesses that would be interested in opening in downtown if, if they could find the right space, the right rent. The problem was that issue, that the, the spaces weren't ready to lease, uh, the, the property owner wanted a creditworthy tenant, which meant a 10-year lease, and um, you know, being able to uh, take up 10,000 square feet. You know, a lot of things that just weren't gonna happen for an independent retailer. 
Um, now, right before the pandemic, I had really high hopes with the completion of High Point south of the square and then the completion of Nicholas north of the square. We were finally seeing a great cluster of retail storefronts that I thought would then blossom into something. Then, of course, the pandemic hit. So uh, part, I think part of it is waiting to see what's going to happen with those spaces in the next year. Try to answer it in one word, yes. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Mark, I hope you found today's forum insightful and optimistic about the future of downtown Columbus. Please make plans to join us next week as CMC presents questions for the next Ohio governor featuring a panel of experts. Thank you to today's sponsors, the Robert Weiler Company, Installed Building Products, and Marker Incorporated. Thank you to our online virtual seat patrons and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch, and a special appreciation to today's speakers, Michael B. Coleman, Mark Conti, Jeff Edwards, and our host, Mark Ferencheck. Thank you all for joining us. We could not do this without you. And we look forward to seeing you next week as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Thank you again.